audit assertions. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's our Facebook page, St. Louis Test Prep, the email, the website, and our book, Cost Accounting for Dummies, that we teach in a free weekly live chat each week. This is a series of uh, questions about a particular area of a business. And what the student was asked to do was to determine which audit assertion uh, applied to these different transactions. Now, they were subject to judgment. I think there was some overlap. But I'd like to go through, through this because it really digs into audit assertions and I think made, made me think about what was going on. So we're talking about an ordering and a sales process. And here's kind of an if-then statement that I created because the student and I started off and we were, he was both, we, both of us were a little confused. So I said, okay, if I audit or trace information from one document to another, then which assertion am I testing? Which assertion am I testing when I go from one document or test to another? And I put a note here that, you know, one test may cover more than one assertion, which is possible. So let's start thinking about some. We have deposits in cash receipts and a cash receipt ledger that we trace to cash in general ledger. So we're tracing from a support document, deposits and cash receipts to cash in the general ledger. Now, let's assume you're using a third party document, which is always more reliable because it's not subject to manipulation as easily, a bank deposit slip. So the first thing it might test is occurrence, did it really happen? You could test completeness. Did all the deposits, according to the bank, get recorded in cash in general ledger? Accuracy is the cash account accurate. So completeness and accuracy in this case are sort of close together. How about uh, we take a sample of shipping documents showing doc documentation of things that we ship to customers. And let's further assume that the document, the shipping document, is a third party shipping document. So we pay a company to do the shipping and they gave us documents showing that we sent your company's product to a customer and here's our third party document. And we're going to care, compare that third-party document showing that we sent something to sales invoices, which indicates that we sold something. And so the question you need to consider here is, are you shipping to the right person? Because the goods that you're shipping is an asset, and part of what this is about is, is authorization and custody of assets. Because who has access to the inventory item? And who approves sending that item to a customer? That would be the authorization side. So one thing a search it might test is, did the sale really happen? Well, if you have a third-party document that you sent something, that's probably pretty good evidence that a sale happened. The fact that you shipped a good probably proves that you had a sale. What if we flip it? What if we trace sales invoices to a shipping document. That other direction probably also proves occurrence. Did it really happen? It tests the legitimacy of the sale. Is the sale legitimate? Which gets us to revenue recognition. Should I recognize revenue? Well, it depends what my criteria is for revenue recognition. If the criteria is when I invoice someone, that's different from when I ship something. When you ship something, it's probably more reliable than just sending a bill because the client has more skin in the game if they're willing to accept goods from you. That's probably a more reliable test of revenue recognition. What I put on the left here for the student was the six basic assertions that are tested on the CPA exam and that people use when they're auditing. And I added a couple of hints that I'll pull up on the screen here. When you see a question that talks about all documents, that probably refers to completeness. And when you see phrasing in a question that talks about at your end or close to your end, hopefully that's a tip off that that question relates to cut off, getting the activity, getting transactions in the right fiscal year, the right time period. Went on to talk about 
cash receipts journal to a bank deposit slip. We did that one. It doesn't matter which direction you go in from receipt to bank deposit slip or the reverse. What you're really proving is occurrence or existence of the deposit. And you could also test, as we saw a few minutes ago, did all the deposits get recorded completeness. Little twist now that we've looked at a shipping document. What about tying a sales invoice that you generate internally, an invoice, to general ledger? Now we shift, and this has to do with presentation. Yes, you had a sale, but did the sale get recorded, which has to do with presentation, or sales properly stated in your general ledger? Could also have to do with completeness. Does the general ledger contain all of the sales invoices that you generated? So we do that a couple of times. And then if I slide down here, how about a purchase order that you, you internally generate authorizing someone in your organization to go buy something and you trace all of those to general ledger? Well, that has to do with presentation. Did we get everything? recorded that we ordered. For example, did all of our inventory purchases get recorded in inventory? Did we collect all of our costs? Shipping receipts we already did. Another one that's starting to go away with technology is canceled checks. So in many cases we maybe we don't get canceled checks with a bank statement but we get a photograph of a check that we wrote, or we get evidence of a debit when we paid a bill. Okay, If you actually get a physical canceled check, that's the same evidence as the bank statement itself because both are third-party documents. They're both coming from your bank. So the assertion that you might consider naming is occurrence or existence. Was cash reduced because we wrote a check? Or was accounts payable reduced because we wrote a check also? Third-party evidence that the check was cash if we're getting a canceled check from a bank. Or we get a bank statement that shows that a check was paid. We could also look at canceled checks and compare them to outstanding checks prior to a bank reconciliation. That's the how we clear on a bank reconciliation cleared checks, canceled checks. Now, a little confusion with cash auditing. Sometimes you will see the phrase cut off bank statement. Most of the time when they say cut off bank statement, they mean a bank statement at the balance sheet date or after the balance sheet date. And you need to get clarification on that if you're in a test. When you say cut off bank statement, which do you mean? If I have a 1231 year end, <coughs> excuse me, at the balance sheet day would be a 1231 bank statement. A cutoff statement might be the month afterward that shows activity from 1231 to the end of January. So you can test cutoff. And it says what we're looking at is comparing the bank statement activity to general ledger to see the deposits and checks written be shortly before, which would be on the 1231 statement, and shortly after your end to try to see if those transactions were recorded in the proper period. A couple of the notes that I put over here for the student. A little confusion about cash equivalents. Cash and cash cash equivalents are considered part of cash. So cash equivalents are very close to cash. So maybe it's commercial paper or something that can be quickly converted into cash or has a maturity date when it becomes cash that's very short. Those are obviously current assets. Okay. Another comment about fraud. The more transactions you have, the more risk that you have of either theft, loss, or maybe even an unintentional error. Fraud is defined as willfully intending to deceive. An unintended error, I just blew it, is not fraud. But the more transactions you have, the more risk of a mistake. Cash being the best example, I always tell people that. 
if you consider journal entries when you're trying to figure out what to record, think about cash first because about half your transactions in a typical business will in include a journal entry to cash. Substantive testing is real testing, tracing documents as opposed to analytical review. And another point with revenue recognition is it has to be cons consistent. So if it's when you send an invoice, you always record revenue when you send an invoice. If it's when you ship a good, it's always recording revenue when you ship a good. Because somebody uh, who's under pressure to perform financially might be motivated to record revenue, to recognize revenue too soon. That is before the end of the year to get that revenue in the prior year. So those are some, th are some thoughts on audit assertions. Remember on the website, stltest.net. Our toughest accounting topics are live chats that I teach on a continuing basis in a small group. These in blue are the topics that people ask me about the most, so I teach small group live chats. And also remember that cost accounting for dummies is something that I teach online. I teach a chapter of it every week in a free online setting. There's a picture of the book, and you can email me if you'd like to sit in on the free live chat. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.